Welcome to our normal Sunday Science Shambles Q and A. Uh, and if you've uh, if you've joined us before, you, you you can avoid the next two minutes because it's me going through roughly the same things, but with very small changes in information. And as a lot of the people who actually watch this uh, are, are pedants, I would imagine in a good way. I would say positively pedantic, not negatively pedantic. You know, evidence based. Uh, for an improvement in the world, obviously. I don't want to in any way uh, lose you at this early stage, but there will be slight differences. Probably for the stage. And if you are able to, whether it's science shambles, book shambles, or cosmic shambles, the whole, any, of, any of the kind of projects that we do, uh, if you are able to support us by Patreon, that keeps things up. Some of it. Uh, our tours are no longer happening and all of our live work is no longer happening and all the things that we used to do uh, to make money are not happening anymore so it's really useful if you are able to and it's very specific there if you are able to there is no guilt or shame if you are unable to uh, financially support us anyway it is great if you are able to support us just with your curiosity and just by joining us that is wonderful as well and uh, also if you can't do Patreon because obviously that uh, is, a, is a regular payment but you do suddenly go oh do you know what I got that, that money in an envelope the other day from that great aunt that I'd forgotten about and uh, um, I'll, I'll give that some of that money over. you can just go to the tip jar uh, which is uh, somewhere on this page um, but it would be very nice if you can support us via Patreon because um, well we've basically stopped increasing the number I'll be very honest with you we, 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 we've hit the number of people who support us on Patreon and it goes no further at the moment and that therefore does make it trickier for us to keep um, our output going um, also I should mention that uh, at least two of the people you're going to see today you can see um, in other uh, well I was going to say other, other shapes not really other shapes they will be using roughly the same um, shape that they've they've been using for the, for the last few years the, the, the human form that they're in uh, and that is the uh, Science in Zero G series, uh, which is uh, Ginny and Helen, both of whom you're going to meet shortly. Um, and there is a bonus seventh episode for all Patreon supporters as well. Uh, there is also the latest episode of Genetic Shambles. That's on human evolution. That was a really that, that was such a fun conversation. And there was so much it really trying to fit it into 50 minutes. We failed or I failed. But there is a lot of interesting stuff about just the new things that we're learning all the time about the fact that these all of these the, the, the different relations that we have not not just denisovans and neanderthals it's just really fascinating both in terms of uh, on the levels of dna and also just the levels of understanding different forms of uh, of, of human societies uh, that appears may well have existed and uh, also adam k is on uh, he's the latest one on the josie and robin book shambles we had a very nice discussion about the nhs his latest book is uh, as you might know lots of uh, different people well-known people talking about their experience with the NHS. Some of them are quite kind of jokey things. Some of them, uh, like Mark Gates's um, entrance uh, entries, is is very very moving and and a, a very uh, powerful um, reminder of why the NHS is such an important thing. And uh, also, Adam told us about his inspiration behind it, which was uh, just how much it cost when a small piece of glass dropped on his head when he was having a holiday in uh, Florida. Um, so. That is uh, all of the announcements you needed, over and done with. Uh, today's show is about neuroscience. It's about the human brain. We might try and venture into other people's brains, other things' brains. Uh, we might even look towards the future of those artificial brains that may well get us out of uh, all of the problems we've got in. Um, so uh, will artificial intelligence be greater than any kind of form of uh, naturally uh, occurring evolved intelligence? We're going to find out. Helen Chersky, I'll start off. Hello. How are start you? Off. Hello. How are you? I am very well. I have a show and tell that I chose specifically for this topic. Shall I? I will show you. And I'm wearing it. See, see when you recognise it. Uh, oh, it. got it. Is it the, the secret dress? The, the mystery colour perception it dress? It is the mystery dress. And if I have just broken your, friend just broken your friendship with whoever in the room, if I bend that down, it is definitely blue and black. Um, <laughs> And uh, it is from 2014, whenever it was, that photograph came out. And if you don't remember, go back and look for the photograph. But this was, if you look for the dress on um, the internet, you will find it straight away. 
And the game with this, of course, was that some people saw it as white and gold and some people saw it as blue and black. And it is blue and black, but the people who saw it as white and gold weren't really wrong, but their brains were just being clever in just the wrong way. They made it, they made a very sensible assumption. And um, very quickly, the way the illusion worked was that your brain is basically processing stuff all the time without you being aware of it. And one of the problems it faces is that if you take something like a banana and you take it into a dark room or a room with blue lighting or a room with red lighting, the banana is still yellow. But obviously all those different lighting situations that changes the light that reflects off the banana. And your brain looks at the lighting, it looks, it knows bananas are yellow, and it just does a correction. But it has to make an assumption about the lighting. And the game with the, 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 the reason the dress really bothered people was that different people's brains made different assumptions about the lighting. And so their brain just interpreted it given assuming either it was fluorescent lighting or natural lighting and neither of them were wrong but it it really bothered everyone that's the first thing and it really showed how clever our brains are they make these these judgments all the time they're looking at the world at things we don't really think about and they are interpreting we don't know what's going on the brain is there's a layer before our consciousness gets there um that's that's making sense of the world and it can occasionally get it wrong. So anyway, so I, I have this because I, I did some filming and I I, I, I I kept it because it's so useful for talks, but I'm pretty sure I've broken friendships with it. You walk down the street and, and people genuinely point and then they say to their friend, I told you so. And then I feel like I need to go and apologise. <laughs> Yes. Well, that's what you're known for, of course, with nearly all the documentaries you've made. You always keep all the costumes, which means that, unfortunately, that is predominantly just scuba diving equipment, isn't it? That's the only time I think you've ever actually had to wear a dress, isn't it? Um, it is. Um, it is. Uh, yeah, I, I very rarely, I occasionally wear a skirt to make a point that a scientist can wear a skirt. But uh, very rarely. well, genuinely, there's a whole there was a whole thing in science TV. They like, no, we have to be basically you either have to be action woman or you have to be so boringly dressed that no one notices what you're wearing. And I thought that was nonsense. Um, so, yeah. So so I, I occasionally do it to, to wind <laughs> I, I, I've, I've worn a flamenco dress. dress for no reason whatsoever. There was no uh, political or cultural uh, revolution intended. It's just uh, that I there was a flamenco dress and uh, I was 21 and I had great legs. So um, <laughs> we're also joined by uh, Anil Seth, who I, I spoke to quite recently. Uh, uh, worked on, worked on, on, uh, has so many. Uh, and, and also we had, I know I've mentioned this every time that we, we meet Anil, but I, it, I still delights me the level of um kind of umbrage you had when we had to deal with uh see the the, the different ideas of, of the universe the idea of the universe being a simulation and our world being a simulation when we did that on infinite monkey cage um that it, it's pr I, it's not the greatest level of umbrage the greatest level of umbrage was the um argument about where we're most likely to find life in the universe uh that almost came to blows until joe brand managed to step in but i reckon it was probably second or third so how's your simulated world going now my simulated world is going fine i still have echoes of that umbrage from from that uh simulation argument it's still like some background radiation it's still always there but now i'm, I'm doing well I'm, I'm in brighton at the moment which has been a you know pretty nice place to be all things considered over the last uh, few months and um, I have a show and tell as well. Is that what I'm supposed to do now? To show you can do, show yeah. You can do. Okay, this well, is your time. You do what you want with it. Oh. It's, it's a you know, <laughs> okay. kitchen knife. Of it's show. It's, that's actually... Normally, I regret not being in the same room as all our panellists. <laughs> and today might not be that day. <laughs> today, I think you're a very lucky person. But this is just half, half of it, actually. The other half of the show and tell is this. And this is a, um, this is a plastic hand otherwise known as a rubber hand, which is this one's not actually rubber, it's plastic, it's a fake hand. And the reason I have it is because it's, it's part of one of the best known, but probably least reliable experiments in, in much of psychology. And that's saying something in psychology these days. Um, the rubber hand illusion has been used for more than 20 years. And I've used it this way too, to make a point about how it's not just our perceptions of things in the world, like blue and black dresses that are creations, constructions of our perceptual systems. It's also our experience of the self too. And it's the experience in this case of what in the world is part of my body and what isn't. Now, this is something we normally take very much for granted because it's the same old body. It's always there. It changes reasonably slowly over time. And we just have this, this experience of what is my body 
this bit, this bit, this bit, and what isn't. Um, it's so continuous, so familiar, it's easy to forget that it is another perception and that it's underpinned by something. It needs explaining. There are many cases in, uh, in neurology and psychiatry where people have disturbances of their experience of their body. There are people, my kind of favorite syndrome here is called somatoparaphrenia, which is where people experience a limb as in fact belonging to somebody else. Uh, they might think it belongs to their brother, their sister, or their doctor, but certainly not theirs. Now, the rubber hand illusion was developed um, or kind of founded a party more than 20 years ago to illustrate that the same kind of thing can, can you can trick uh, the brain to make false inferences about what is the body in the relatively uh, benign circumstances. So the idea was if you have a, a fake hand, I can put it um, in front of somebody, let's say I put it in front of somebody watching this, and then I will take a brush and stroke the hand. And if I stroke the person's real hand at the same time, the idea is the brain is seeing a fake hand roughly where a normal hand would be, feeling touch and seeing touch. So the brain makes its best guess, its inference, that the hand is in fact part of the body. Now, something like this might be going on, but almost more than two decades of research into the experience of body ownership has been built on this. And what we're recently discovered is that it, it may all be on very, very shaky foundations indeed. Uh, a colleague of mine, Pete Lush, over the last couple of years, tried the rubber hand illusion on about 400 people. And at the same time for each of them, he measured how hypnotizable they were, how high they scored on scales of so-called imaginative suggestion. And what he found was that people who reported experiencing the hand as really theirs, and by the way, the reason I've got the, you forgot about the knife, the reason I have the knife is because that's a way to test whether it works. You have the hand, you stroke it for a bit, let me get this the right way around, I don't want to do anything unexpected with the knife. And then when people claim they feel the hand to be theirs, well, you, you stab it. And uh, you get quite a reaction if it's working well. But what it seems to come down to is the degree to which this works depends almost by and large on how hypnotizable a person is, which isn't to say people don't have this experience. People have this weird, slightly uncanny experience that the hand is kind of part of their body, but they know it isn't. But it's probably driven by their openness to hypnotic suggestion. And this is, for me, very interesting because it sort of shows um, that this story we've become very comfortable with, that the brain integrates sensory information from different modalities, um, really could do with a second look. And that second look might extend all the way to huge literature now, which is trying to tell all sorts of stories about how we build up this experience of, of, of self. And um, it's, you know, it's the same across a lot of psychology now, that Unless you recognize that people differ in all sorts of ways, you may end up making very, very shaky inferences about what's actually going on in the brain. Ginny, you had your hand up. Yeah, I just I found that really interesting about the how hypnotized are because, are, because, because I do this in one of my stage shows that I do in schools and events and stuff. So I've done it a lot of times and I found that it works best on kids between the age of about 10 and 12. Um, adults and older kids seem to kind of fight it more so even if they are feeling it they maybe won't admit it in front of everyone and younger kids I can generally sometimes they'll say oh it feels weird but they can't really express what it's what's happening um, and the adults that I have done it on that it's worked it usually takes a lot lo longer whereas I found that with like 10 year olds sometimes you only do it a couple of times and straight away they go it's my it feels like it's my hand so I'd be really interested to know if there's been any any research on age groups uh, there that probably has to I, I don't know off the top of my head and I had it would be very interesting to, to know you know exactly is there this trajectory over time to how you know yeah how open people are to, to suggestions as well. And it could well be um, that there's an age-related trajectory to that because you know, part of why hypnosis works, and hypnosis does work, it's a very legitimate and interesting scientific topic. You can think of it, or I like to think of it, as installing sort of high-level expectations about what to experience. And um, exactly what's going on, we don't really know, but it seems at least plausible to me that certain ages are more amenable to having these kinds of expectations uh, installed. 
Now, this is interesting. Have, 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 anyone, heard, anyone heard the Infinite Monkey Cage about the uh, the human brain um, with uh, Gina Rippon and uh, uh, David Eagerman um, the other week? Uh, we only didn't even get to question one, uh, and I have an inkling this is going to happen today as well. So I apologise to everyone who sent in questions because I want to add two things, questions which I have, which is, is one thing that I find is when we talk about suggestibility, how do it because. I've spoken to people who've kind of done hypnot, uh, hypnotism shows and people who've also been on stage. And that by suggestibility, do we mean the, also the desire to please? Because that seems to be, I've, I've certainly heard about some, some very well-known people who've done hypnotism that, that the squeeze on the arm and the little bit which basically says, don't screw this up is like so that when you then start eating the onion or you're eating the onion while singing Heartbreak Hotel or whatever it might be, it's actually, I, I don't let people down. So this this some, so interests me is whether this means this is something also, when we say suggestibility, we're also talking about something involved very much the social kind of part of, of, of the mind. And I, I don't know whether Ginny or, uh, or Anna want to add to anything to that. I mean, I think they're, they're very closely related. So that there's... There's, there's all these factors that can, can influence how people respond in situations like that. One, one would be uh, this idea of, of yeah, not wanting to, uh, wanting to satisfy the experimenter or wanting to satisfy the, the hypnotist. Um, this is related to what we would call in experimental design demand characteristics. If, people, if it's very clear to people what they're supposed to do, then they might well do that uh, because they don't want to let the person down. Uh, that can take you so far, but I think, at least in my understanding, this whole business about suggestibility and hypnosis goes further because the point here is that it's not just people saying something in order to please the experimenter. Uh, they actually have the experiences they, they report having. So in this case, it's not that people are just saying, yeah, oh yeah, no, I feel it's my hand. If you, if you just so, you know, use the knife again, if you get the, they do show a physiological response and so to me, it, it makes sense to think no, they are having that experience. And hypnosis in some people can actually generate subjective phenomena. And it's a, it leads to a very interesting set of questions, which is, well, how far does that go? You know, how far can you, can you combine all these different influences to change what people experience, even though you know, there's no actual sensory data corresponding to that thing? All right. If we have time at the end, we'll about the out-of-body experience and the links with uh, uh, reactions to the rubber hand illusion. But Ginny, we're at the very least, if we're not going to get to any questions, we are going to get to your show and tell. Uh, what have you got today for us? So I've also brought an illusion and it actually links in really nicely because it's also about how our brain makes assumptions and kind of tries to work out what's going on in the world. So I have got uh, this, which is a mask of a gorilla um, and it's in a stand but if it wasn't in the stand it'd be the sort of thing you could you know wear to a kid's party or something uh, but this is gonna I'm gonna show you what's known as the hollow mask illusion uh, so if I put this on a turntable and then I start rotating you can see this is the back which is the bit that sticks out this side sticks in but if I start rotating it hopefully you will see something weird start to happen at some point and then it stops so as it goes round, at some point, most people will see it start to look like the face is sticking out the front rather than sticking in. And I'm seeing lots of nodding from Helen and Anil and everyone. Um, and this is a, is a really fun illusion. And it's based on the fact that we know that most faces stick out. So we've all seen a lot of faces throughout our lives. And 99.999 something percent of them have been convex not concave. So what's happening here is the light is hitting this mask, but it's doing it in a way that is um, ambiguous. Uh, so when it's at the side, there's no way you can see it as anything differently. It's definitely going in. But when it comes around to the front, there are two different ways that your brain could interpret the way the light's hitting the shape. It could either be light hitting it from one direction and it's a sticky outy face or from another direction and it's a uh, concave face. Um, and your brain just has to decide which of those is most likely, just like it did in Helen's dress example. It was an ambiguous uh, picture. You had to decide, is it white and gold? Is it 
blue and black. And that's not a conscious decision. It's something your brain does without you, whatever you is, and we'll probably talk about that a bit later, um, actually having anything to do with it. But in this case, because everyone has seen faces, almost everyone, most people will see it sticking out. There are always some people who don't. Everyone's brain works a little bit differently and some people just don't fall for certain illusions as much. Um, but most people will make the assumption that that sticks out. So what I find that. really interesting about that is that it clearly is that it clearly sees it the first way round. It's not like there's no prior information. You very mm. definitely have prior information that yeah. tells you what it is. But your brain still can't do it. it. It's an instantaneous interpretation. And I find that, I don't know how common that is, but I find that really interesting. That it I doesn't use this huge wealth of history it has at that point. I think it's because it's something that you have so much history of. If it was a weird kind of shape that you'd only seen a couple of times, I might, I haven't actually tested that, but my instinct is it wouldn't happen in the same way. Uh, because yes, you have prior information that I just showed you now, but you also have huge amounts of prior information that says faces stick out. So that kind of outweighs your knowledge of this particular face in this example. There's a distinction that we often make between, make, between things, between things. I think this gets to, to your point there, that, that some things are what we would call cognitively penetrable, uh, which is when knowing something is the case changes mm -hmm. how you perceive it. So in this case, if we, we know that it's a mask, but it it doesn't change that the illusion works. So it's not, it's, it, we say it's cognitively impenetrable. Um, mm. not, but not everything is like that. Some, some illusions, knowing what's going on, changes uh, how you perceive things. Uh, so, but, an exact, but quite what marks the difference is, is again really unclear. But I think you're absolutely right, Ginny, that it's, it's not just each of us has lots of experiences of stick of faces being outward, outwardly pointy. It's the whole history of visual systems through our evolution has been shaped by those experiences. And yeah. that's why it's, you know, we can't think our way out of that kind of evolutionary her heritage. It looked white and gold to me anyway. So uh, <laughs> this is that, what I mean. This is the because of our obviously our, our seeking of faces. I'm kind of intrigued by what other I know you, you, you mentioned about, you know, not that many, not much search into other objects. Because that's what I'm intrigued by. Is if it's what other objects does the brain do that? What what other objects does it make assumptions about? I mean, well, no, that kind of assumption, like if if you took something and you showed mm. the convex concave, uh, I'm thinking that how much does the fact that it's a face and our need to find a face play the part in creating that illusion because obviously you know it, it yeah. takes you know a plug uh, two dots you know it, it, it's two dots and a line and and we have made the even got to the point of creating a personality behind <laughs> a face mm. yeah. i mean it, 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 it does apply beyond faces there's if you just dig a hole in some sand mm. you know, we, we will well, tend you two things. You dig a hole in sand or you make a small equivalent pile of sand so it's just just a a gap or a, or a little lump, uh, we will see those, and, and you can have them so that it's exactly the same flat image. You, you can sort of set it up so that the image is the same. We will always experience it as if light is coming from above. So um, we have a, another prior that's deeply baked into our visual systems exactly that, well, you know, the sun's always in the sky um, to the extent that it's there. And so when we're trying to figure out what shape an object is, in virtue of shadows, um, that's a prior that the brain uses, and that will make us see things as as concave when actually they might be convex, even just a simple pile of sand. Brilliant. Right. And well, we actually go oh, go on. Oh, I was just going to say, there's a nice um, illusion that you can find online that has sort of four grey dots, and they're just shaded, so they're dark on one side and light on the other, and we will always see them as as if the sun's coming from above. So the, if the light's on the top, then it's concave. If the light's on the bottom, then it's convex. And if you turn them upside down, they all flip, um, which is quite fun. Brilliant. The, uh, brilliant. The, uh, the, it was Richard Gregory, wasn't it, who did some, a, a lot of interesting, uh, there's really? still a few of his books um, around as well. I've, I've still got the one that came out in 1969 with 3D glasses, 199, Oxfam <laughs> Salisbury. Thank you. I can't um, have adding, though. I'm going to start. The one last stuff is, is <laughs> maybe not, that the light from above prior can be changed. There's some very interesting studies that if you train people for long enough, 
in a situation where the light is coming from a different direction, they will eventually see it differently. And, and this is this is sort of surprising for me because it just speaks to the fact that our perceptual apparatus might be more changeable than, than we think. We just assume that the way we see the world is, is well, that's the way. And, and that's, that's because we have this sense of naive reality that we're not actually constructing it. We're just opening our eyes are just transparent windows onto an objective reality. Uh, but it's not like that, as, as we've amply demonstrated already. And because of that, we can probably change the way we see things more than we think. It's interesting, yeah. When you, you're trying to use a, a, a method, a, a, a method which aims for objectivity to analyse uh, subjective experience, uh, this is why, as you said, yeah, there's never a. Well, I think this might be the. Lo oh no, it's not the last thing. Here's another thing, and here's another bit. <laughs> this is so, Ginny. I'm going to ask you the first. First question is from Brian, and uh, he would like to know how come the myth about humans only using ten percent of our brains has gained such traction things here and one is that if something is easy to remember we're more likely to believe that it's true um, so this goes as far as there have been studies that have shown that if you tell someone something in rhyme form they're more likely to believe you and we think that's because rhymes are really easy to remember and our brain has this assumption that if something comes to mind easily that probably means I've heard it lots of times and that probably means it's true. Uh, so one of the slight issues with talking about this is there's also evidence that the more you debunk something the more you reinforce it because you've just told people again we only use 10% of our brains and now they've heard me saying that and if they don't remember everything else that we're saying tonight they might just remember oh I heard Robin and Ginny talking about only using 10% of your brain um, and that might actually reinforce it so that's yeah slightly worrying like all good myths I think there probably was an element of truth in it at some point and it's just kind of been taken out of context so we aren't using every neuron in our brain all the time um, if we were that would would just you wouldn't be able to provide information it's like if every pixel on a screen was on at the same time all you'd have is a white screen that wouldn't give you any information you need that on and off to actually provide content so not all of our neurons are active at the same time but over the course of a day or certainly a week all of our neurons in our brain will get used at some point um, but i think people also like the idea that there's untapped potential out there, I think people like the idea that, oh, if we could just find a way of getting to it, suddenly we could all be, you know, 10 times smarter. Um, so I think, yeah, probably lots of elements to it. Elements to it. Is that, I mean, Helen, that this seems to be a problem, in fact, which then is, is in science communication and communication about climate change, et cetera, that it's very easy to remember. Hang on, climate's always changed on the planet Earth. Polar bears have just are actually much bigger or whatever it might be. It, it's much easier to create a, a simple idea, which is wrong. Then, as as we know, you know, more often than not with 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 science, it's uh, things are, are more complex than that first appear the human brains really don't like nuance and you know i'm not a neuroscientist but i'm quite comfortable in saying that because we are so good at trying to look for patterns and, and ways around things and it's it is really common that people and but, you know there's this motivated reasoning thing that people will fit that they will actually you know it becomes kind of slightly more serious when people are not necessarily deliberately but when they get a new piece of information they will shoehorn it to what they already think rather than using it as an independent Piece. And that's where we get these people who go, oh, but, you know, the eastern Antarctic ice sheet is increasing or whatever, you know, whichever tiny little fact out of context factoid it is. And the problem is, that, like Ginny says, you, you, you almost you can't have a debate. You will never change that person's mind. And, and the, the question comes as a scientist, well, you know, is I have a limited amount of time. I have some science to do. But obviously you want to be open and share, you know, you want to be open to the public and show that you're you're listening to them and taking on board the things they're saying but ultimately there's this this practicality thing which is that you're never going to change their mind and you have a limited amount of time and you just can't engage with all of them all of the time and so and so I think it generates a problem because then people say oh but then you know there's always I, the emails I get I'm sure you all get them as well going oh here's my pet theory and no one will listen to me can you just <laughs> pass it on to professor x because he might listen to you 
you know, and they're they're desperate for validation. But the reason everyone's ignoring them is because you ca- you just can't get involved in the debate because they're not listening to you. And so there's a whole, you know, the nuance in science. That's a whole separate topic. Which um, there's no there's no one's ever really got a resolution to. We try and we try. We put in as much time as we can. But when you get, you know, the fifty, literally the fiftieth email from a climate denier, even though you didn't answer any of the other forty nine. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe you gave a polite explanation, look at this thing, please go away to the first one. You know, it, it it's genuinely very difficult. And it, these questions of ethics come into how the brain works, I think, because how, how are you an ethical human being, given that we know all the weird things a human brain does? Like, does that change how the ethics of that situation, how you choose to spend your time? Anyway, that's probably a separate debate. Yeah, it's, it's a, we, we often get somewhere near. The, it was interesting. I was talking with uh, Aoife McLysat the other day, and she was saying that whenever she gets uh, asked, and I'm sure you probably all do this anyway, Sid, but when she gets asked to those kind of debates like, is evolution true? She never actually is answering the person she's debating with, because that yeah. person may well be a sophist, or a dogmatist or whatever it might be she's always thinking i'm not talking i'm not going to go down oh oh we have a very frozen frozen received. robin not yet received the information yeah. and still to. have to those and i think it, it is a, it's a tough thing to do um Anil, now we're going to a uh, nice easy one for you uh this is from dr bad crumble who uh, also says this this isn't really a question. So uh, first of all, we have to define what a question is. There's a lot of philosophical uh, traps we might be falling down. Um, but it, uh, Dr. Bad Crumble is very interested in, in how we think in terms of in pictures, in words, in concepts, and how this differs amongst people and what we've learned from people who perhaps have suffered brain injuries, strokes, etc. So that idea of because it, to me, it's always a fascinating thing, which is when you try, it's like trying to hear the voice in your head and go, it is both a voice that you can hear, mm-hmm. and yet it is also, it has no quality to it in, in, in some way. So so that bit of the visualization, the conceptualization in our minds, what we've learned about the disparity in that. Yeah, this is a, it's a, it's a great, great known question. Um, and it's it's very difficult to know just to, to have that much to say about it because um yeah, a lot of uh trying to understand human perceptual experience we at least have some sort of benchmarks you know, we can show people images on screens and get them to report what they see and and so on um and when you get further away from just simple perceptions and, and movement and things to this rather abstract and decoupled from the world ideas about how people think um, what kind of mental or visual imagery they might have. Uh, we're still mainly reliant on people's self-reports about these things. And we have no idea how to compare these self-reports. We have very little idea. You know, you, if I say I've got really, if I say I think in pictures and I have very vivid mental imagery, you know, how do we know how to compare that to you who might say something different? What, what's the benchmark? Um, now, it's not hopeless because there are, you know, there are just there are reliable differences. There are very kind of lots of um, useful questionnaire measures that you can use to try to capture variance. So you know, typically, you might think on this axis of p- some people who think uh, more linguistically, more in terms of logic or propositions or, or, re- or explicit, you know, step one, step two, step three, and then people who think more imagistically more in terms of, of scenes and, and um, without particular narratives. I think we all probably do uh, a bit of both. And of course, a, a big part of thinking, we, we just, we don't have any introspective access to at all. It all goes on under the hood and a thought just appears or we know something, or we understand something that we didn't do uh, previously. So even these basic questionnaire measures though, they do speak to quite a large variance, quite a lot of differences in how people's inner lives are. So it's a little bit like we were talking earlier about suggestibility. This turns out to be a trait that is you know, remarkably distributed across uh, populations. Um, now, I tend to think that I don't have very good uh, visual imagery. Uh, and what I think where we can hope to go a little bit in the future is to try and pin things like this down a little bit more objectively. And it's there are ways to do that. So, so one, one very interesting emerging line of research is to compare brain activity in imagery to 
say actual perception so you get somebody to look at a picture they see it they're, they're really having that perceptual experience and then you get them to engage in some imagery of it and then you compare not only what they say about these experiences but but how similar uh, the the brain activity is to these experiences but also how wh where the difference is like because imagining something visually is never the same as actually seeing it there is always a difference so what explains that difference of course it's a, very important there's a difference our ability to imagine would be quite problematic if we were confusing it all the time for the real world yeah. this actually it's a little sidebar i mean this is probably why we forget most dreams um it's not it would be very confusing if we confuse dream world with with real world uh, too and we know this because when internally generated content becomes perceived as real uh we start to give people labels like psychosis. That's one way of thinking about psychosis. It's when internally generated perceptions have this sheen of reality. You said, Robin, that, that you know you, your inner voice doesn't have, um, it doesn't have, what, what did you say? It doesn't have presence? I can't remember the words you used. Yeah, it, well, it, it doesn't have tone or accent. It doesn't have tone yet, or accent, and yet I can right. hear it. So whatever I'm doing is there is something being heard, but it is being heard, you know, it, it, in, in a way that it is without definition. Yeah. Imagine if, if um, suddenly your internal voice had definition, had presence, was perceived as being real. You know, that, that's a good, or at least a, you know, a stab at a definition of what an auditory hallucination is like. It's when your inner voice becomes experienced as an actual other voice. Um, and that's you know, generally uh, not a good thing, although it's not always a bad thing. Uh, Charles Fernihoff has done some great work sort of mm -hmm. normalizing uh, voice hearing. A lot of people actually hear voices as voices with tones and qualities and accents and, and, and so on. And uh, in, a, in quite a large fraction of cases, it's not debilitating at all. It's just something that people are often quite reluctant to to talk about because they're afraid of getting labeled as being uh, psychotic or, or otherwise, you know, otherwise unwell. So that there is a large variance. So I think in reflecting that sort of non-question, I've given a kind of non-answer just to point to, yeah, there's a, there, there's a lot. Um, and unusual sort of neurodiverse uh, individuals can certainly exhibit sort of extremes of, of thinking, but you don't even have to go there. What, one condition that one of uh, one of my colleagues is looking into is a, something called aphantasia and this is a, a condition where people claim to have no visual imagery at all to the extent that the question doesn't even make much sense so what do you mean by visual imagery uh, to me it makes some sense it's just i would not think i've got it very strongly but there are people indeed who claim to not even be able to have any kind of internal visual thinking uh, but they they you know you wouldn't generally know this from the outside and of course they tend to think of it as being um normal so a lot of these inner which again makes me think we're all having these very different inner lives which are all hidden from us because we all look more or less the same from the outside well this is G Ginny you had something you wanted to add to that yeah I would say that I made that a podcast recently with um a girl who discovered she had a fantasia when she started working um with us at the British Psychological Society making podcasts and, and she was doing something on mental imagery and she was like, I don't know what this is. Um, and then she made a podcast kind of about aphantasia and how weird it was to think about other people actually seeing stuff in their minds when it just meant nothing to her. She didn't understand what that would have been like, what it would have felt like. It was really interesting. I'd never heard of it before. Um, before yes. that, well, I wanted. Uh, so I was just going to throw something in. So I was just um, going to throw something in, um, which is on in terms of what we would monitor. I know fMRI results. I know that you know that we we, we could just we have to be careful. What I said, but for instance, when I had a, a a brain scan and I was meant to have the bit where the brain at rest, I'm not very good at turning it off. So I instead <laughs> playing the film The Long Good Friday in my head, not deliberately. It was not by choice. It just I was playing that. Now, if we looked at what is going on in my or your brain, for instance, when I'm thinking a lot, like, you know, not merely on stage, but normally there's a lot of voices, a lot of different narratives going on. Or indeed, if I'm thinking about very specific visual things, sometimes at night, if I'm if I'm bored, I will just start to revisit rooms that I used to go to. Now, would that appear, if, if we looked at fMRI, to be similar to me 
looking i don't know how much how much we can even narrow down on this but would it appear to be similar to the exterior experiences of looking at that room or having at that conversation Ginny. to yes. some extent yeah. yes right <laughs> yeah there would be difference if you are remembering a room you'd also have activation in your memory networks that you wouldn't necessarily have if you were just looking at the room um, but there have actually been um, cases of people with locked-in syndrome who, when they they only discovered that they were more conscious than that the doctors realised, which again, levels of consciousness may be something that Anel might want to uh, go into in a minute, but um, by putting them in brain scanners and asking them to imagine they were playing tennis and they could see activation in their motor networks, um, but other people who were deeper in comas didn't have that same activation. Right, Anel, you've got your hand up. Yeah, <laughs> literally yeah. there. Um, yeah, no, yeah, no, it's, um, yeah. Just to just add, add to that a, a little bit that um, it, well, but it's, it was also it's really mainly for the, the patient stuff that I think Ginny, you were talking about. That's mainly people in vegetative state. So the, that's the, the one the distinction there. And it's, it's like it's locked in was um, for those of people might have read the diving bell and the butterfly. This brilliant book by Jean Michel Bobby. These are people who are actually completely conscious, just completely paralyzed. The, the tricky part is when patients are diagnosed as being unconscious because they seem behaviorally unresponsive. And this was worked by Adrian Owen and, and Melanie Bowley a long time ago, but absolutely uh, sort of foundational, I think, because indeed they, they showed that people who couldn't um, externally respond to a question could nonetheless engage in, in mental imagery. But the reason they chose tennis and house, uh, wandering around your house, the rooms of your house, Robin, as you were doing, while you, and, and playing tennis is because we know uh, that uh, in, in healthy people, they engage almost completely non-overlapping brain networks. Um, and so they would be maximally easy to differentiate when you put people, because for instance, you could, you could look at, let's say the, the um, auditory cortex, there would be a difference somewhere, very subtle difference in the auditory cortex between hearing those two different sentences. But you never pick that up. The, the, the activity is going to be very similar. So indeed, you see auditory cortex activation in people in the vegetative state when they hear sound, when they hear sentences. So it was the key was the content of that was sufficiently different that you could see it. And also they had to engage in this imagery for about 30 seconds um, at, a, at a time, um, which put it outside of what could reasonably be expected to occur just as an unconscious reflex. Um, so, but the other, the only, just the other thing I was, I was going to say was there's been some really nice, uh, also brain imaging work where you, you have people look at, let's say, different pictures um, in a waking state. And then you ask them, either they're dreaming or you ask them to imagine and they're still in the brain scanner. And you can, using machine learning, you can now begin to decode what they're dreaming about or what they're, what they're imagining. But the key limitation there is you can only really do that when you've got a, the right training set of data. So if you've only shown people, let's say, a few pictures of different houses, then the results of whatever they happen to be thinking about, your algorithm is going to pick one of those houses. And they may have been thinking about something totally different. But that's a kind of technology that's, that is improving all the time. And it's quite conceivable that uh, we'll get to a stage where through passive brain imaging, we can make a good stab at what somebody might be um, uh, imaging inside their own head or, or what might be going on when they're dreaming. Can I, I've got a question. Oh, sorry, Robin's probably got, got a question. No, 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 I was, I was, no I was, I, I, you can't say, of course, but, but to me, I was pointing directly at you. Uh, <laughs> you, you know, the way it is sometimes. I've, so, I've once done that thing, you've done, 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 done it where you're having a Zoom meeting with someone or Skype, and there's something on your screen, but it's actually roughly where their nose is. And um, for some reason, psychologically, <laughs> it feels wrong to do that because it feels like you would be doing that in, in reality. Sorry, Helen, you have something far more interesting oh, to I'm say. Oh, I'm slightly worried now that when we can all meet up in person, people are going to be coming up to me and poking my nose because they've been doing that on their, their screens the whole time. So what I was, was going to ask was, I think there's a really interesting question here about our, t our intolerance of the idea that somebody else's brain works differently to ours. So when I did the show on colour, that was why I bought this dress, um, I asked on Twitter, like, what are the questions you want to know about colour? And literally 50%, that is not an exaggeration, of all the answers were, is the red that you see the same as the red that I see? And then you go into these things, um, you know, as you just described, someone who didn't know that 
mental imagery was a thing. And it's really disturbing. And I think there's a really important point here about our tolerance of neurodiverse ways of thinking, which is that, is there a way that through understanding this, we can help people be more tolerant? Because it's such a, it's not even threatening your identity. It's threatening your literal sense of self. If you say, well, your brain just works in such an alien way that you're sort of different. And then we're social creatures and go, oh, but but I must be right. My brain must be right. And you must be weird. And is there anything in here that helps us sort out that this idea that, you know, I don't know how you express all these different things going on in people's heads. But, you know, so perhaps someone has more mental imagery and someone has something else. And it's all right. It's just a bit different. You know, how do we is, is there is, does the science let us say something about how to be more tolerant or why it's so distressing that that some people might be different. Jenny, do you, I mean, I presume because you've done, and I'll, you've I'll, done, and I'll, I'll ask Anna in a moment as well. But you know, having done a lot of live events, where you may well have moments where what you reveal individually, people have kept inside their head, and they have that moment of going, "I thought that was uniquely and rather terrifyingly only my uh, experience." A lot more of the opposite I... way round. So what happens a lot is that I show an illusion, <laughs> and half a dozen people put their hand up and very proudly tell me that the illusion didn't work on them. Um, and there almost seems to be a kind of like, oh, I don't know, I'm not trickable or, um, but it's, it's always different people for different illusions. So if I do half a dozen illusions on the same crowd, it's not that one person won't see any of them. It seems to be that just some people don't see some illusions. And there are some that are much more robust and that almost everyone will see every time. And there are some that are much more hit and miss. Um, so I think that sometimes, at least in the audiences that come to science shows, particularly Cosmic Shambles type audiences, there's sort of a bit of that, I want to be untrickable. There's thing. a brilliant example of that, though. So you both, you, everyone will have seen this. Is that there's that video? There's that video of the um, people, the, the the people dressed in white throwing a white ball, and the people dressed in black yeah. throwing a black ball, and the gorilla comes on, right? And you can, I have seen one of the best things I've ever seen done was someone showed that at Cheltenham Science Festival, and the gorilla comes on. If you've seen it before, you see the gorilla, and then you know they ask exactly the question you asked. So who saw the illusion? And all these people are like really proud. I I saw the gorilla. I wasn't fooled. And then they said, did you? You notice the curtains change color and <laughs> the entire backdrop had changed color and all these people who were so smug that they had seen the gorilla you know <laughs> had to shut up <laughs> and it was but brilliant going Sorry. back to your comment about kind of um empathy and, and neurodings i think one of the things that has changed in our understanding of mental health over the last i don't know 10 years maybe is that we're not putting people in boxes that you're either autistic or you're not autistic it's we've realized that everyone's in a spectrum and I think everyone's accepted that for autism now but I think it's starting for everything else so we were talking uh, Anil you were talking a bit earlier about uh, psychosis and actually with this idea of mental imagery and whether you are good at knowing what's external to your brain and what's internal to your brain we're all on a spectrum with that as well and and actually when it comes to mental illness, what that means is you've reached a point in the spectrum where it started affecting your everyday life. And that point might be different for different people. So you might have someone who actually has symptoms of psychosis, but it's not affecting their life. Maybe they hear voices, but they're kind of nice voices and they're fine with it. And actually that doesn't necessarily need to be categorized as a mental health disorder. It's just a different state of being and if it's not affecting them negatively then it's kind of fine and i'm going to give you because uh, i'm going to give you because uh, we, we've got two questions in at least so that's not a bad start um which is, now this is uh, this from roly who would like to know how can we prove consciousness in non-human species that's a very interesting area in, in and i know and i suppose then we even end up with the, the problem of defining uh consciousness so let's let's pretend we've defined that and let's move on <laughs> it's a very smart think, yeah, it's, it, we can get stuck on the definition question for, for far too long this is this is a very very tricky question to answer because it's we we have intuitions about how far consciousness extends and let's just define it very very vaguely so if you're conscious, there is something it is like to be you. You, know, you, there, you, you, you have some subjective experience, not necessarily a form of human experience, but there, there's some subjective experience going on for that thing. And most of us have intuitions that uh, 
other people are conscious, other humans, although it's even you know, quite difficult maybe to be 100% certain about that. And all of us would have intuitions that something like a vacuum cleaner is maybe not conscious. And then when we start talking about living things, this is something I often do in, in talks as well, as you can ask an audience, like, so you know, wh where do you draw the line? Or, or where does, or, you know, then people say, but there is no line. You know, it's just, it sort of shades out and say, okay, but where does it shade out into basically nothing? And, um, and you say, well, okay, what about primates? And pe most people's hands are still up if you raise your hand for, you know, yes, I think conscious. And then you ask, um, well, what about other mammals? And people think dogs, cats, yeah, that's fine. Uh, and then you sort of go, I, I hesitate to use the word down the scale, but, but you, you sort of increase the simplicity of the, of the organism that you're considering. Um, birds, fish, insects bacteria at some point people's intuitions are that, that there's no consciousness going on but how do we actually know well the problem is that in the neuroscience of consciousness there is no consensus about the sufficient conditions we don't know enough to say if you have this going on in a system then it is conscious uh, lots of proposals about what that might be but no real consensus about it so we have we're left with this idea that we need to extrapolate out from humans and really other primates. You know, primate brains are so similar to ours and their behavior is so similar. We're so closely related. It would be really weird to start from a premise that, that primates are unconscious. The only people who might make that kind of claim are people who have an unusual definition of consciousness that's too biased towards the human. Like conscious, if, you, if you intrinsically associate consciousness with language, for instance, then the circle of the magic circle where where you allocate it is going to be very narrow too. But then you would say, well, you know, what about newborn babies? They, they don't qualify. And people go, oh, okay, fine. Well, can't have language then. So if it's a if it's a more basic idea of any kind of experience, then we start to think, okay, what are the net what what's at, what is going on in human and primate brains that seems to underpin consciousness? And how far can we see that process also happening in, in other species? And I think the interesting thing is we, we go, as we understand more about not just this brain area or that brain area, but actually the, the reasons why this brain area or that brain area might be important in human consciousness, then we can start to look more broadly and say, okay, fish don't have a prefrontal cortex, but do they have other brain systems that might you know, implement the same processes that we think are important for, for human uh, consciousness? So it's this kind of gradual extrapolation. Um, and then you can also ask behavioral experiments. So we can sort of do the sorts of things that, that uh, we know in humans distinguish between uh, conscious perception and unconscious perception. And typically they're asking for things like, can you, were you confident that you saw something? If I flash an image very quickly, uh, sometimes you don't consciously see it, but you might guess right. But if I ask you, were you, confident in whether you saw the image that's very very tightly tied to whether you consciously saw it or not so if you adapt some of these paradigms to other animals by as training them to make judgments about not just what they perceive but how confident they were what they perceived then you can start to to make some stronger claims about consciousness elsewhere that of course raises the danger that you're actually testing not just consciousness but something else an animal has to have the cognitive capacity to make things like confidence judgments, which is not clear that, you know, it, it could be that you could have conscious experiences without having that uh, cognitive capacity. For me, it's still a bit of a, it's still a, it's still a little bit unclear. And I think I have to be sort of professionally and, hum and modestly agnostic about this. I mean, while I, I was very, very influenced by spending time with octopuses because they are so different from us that a lot of the intuitions that we'd normally use to guide our, our judgments about just aren't there. Um, yet, they're super smart um, and they have very large and interestingly structured brains um, that it's a real sort of challenging edge case. If you spend time with an octopus, it's, it's, it's very, very difficult to believe anything other than you're in the presence of another conscious creature of some sort. 
I think it's fascinating that idea. It is a baby actually conscious? At what point? Conscious, at, at what, what point? At what point do we see? What is there something for to be like that baby? It's um, we're going to Ginny. We've got a question from Dominic. Uh, if birds are able to see magnetic fields overlaying the countryside, and other animals are able to see a wider spectrum, <laughs> is it likely that our brains are able to perceive more from our senses than we are aware of, and that we may, may loss have lost mental abilities that our ancestors had? So it's a really, really difficult to ask, answer evolutionary questions about the brain because brains don't fossilise. So it just becomes really, really difficult to say. I mean, you can look at like skull size and kind of make estimates of how big a brain is. But to say whether we had senses that we then lost is really challenging. What we can say is that we can give humans new senses. So there have been some studies that have used kind of vibrations in various ways to, to augment senses. So there was one where they gave people a sense of where north was. So they had a vibrating, uh, I think it was a belt, and when they moved it, it vibrated in different positions. And they found that people really quickly learnt to use this and kind of integrated it into that body schema, just like that people may or may not have been integrating the rubber hand, um, but we, the way we think, think or thought that worked. Um, and they felt weird when it was taken away. So we know that it can happen. Um, the other thing with senses that's quite interesting is we kind of think of it as the sense organs that are important, but actually the brain is just as important. So there's um, a lot of animals that actually have more uh, colour receptors in their eyes than we do. And probably the most famous one that people might have heard of is the mantis shrimp, which has something like 12 to 15 uh, different colour receptors in its eyes. So for a while, people thought that meant that they must be able to see loads more colours than we can. But actually, some um, experiments have shown that they can't differentiate colours as well as humans can, despite the fact we've only got three colour receptors because of all the levels of processing that our brain does. So our brain kind of compares input from pairs of receptors and does all these levels of processing that allow us to make these really good fine discriminations, whereas mantis shrimp do something more similar to which one of the 15 is on and therefore actually can see fewer colours. So there's all these different kind of levels of processing and ways of looking at it that make it kind of an even harder but more interesting question to answer. While we're in the water, we've got a question for you, Helen. This is from Eleanor, age five. Hello, Eleanor. Uh, she would like to know why don't uh, fish she would like to know why don't fish drown? <laughs> <laughs> um, it breathes in a different way to us. So we had lungs. We, you know, a fish. Uh, when the human drowns, it's because water gets down into their respiratory system, their lungs, and basically they can't, they, they suffocate because they can't get enough oxygen because all the delicate bits are filled up with water. Whereas fish have gills and the water can flow over the gills and um, it doesn't, there's, there's no air filled lungs that can get full up with water. So water just flows over the surface and then out the back. And there's no uh, gaseous air involved in any point, but we can drown because we need air filled lungs to take gas in and out. Um, yeah, it's, I mean, and of course, uh, human embryos have structures that look like gills and so if you're into the whole inner fish thing was it neil shubin <laughs> that book um mm. you know that you can see the the evolutionary structures from early on that that we all had gills at some point we just didn't use them and and they you know were lost as our body patterns developed brilliant uh anna would like, uh, anna would uh, like a, 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 a question for you anna which is uh philip would like to know can consciousness exist outside the brain no Great. This is why I asked you that because we've got so little time left. Um, the uh, it's such a it's a beautiful idea though, isn't it? That just at death, it, it, it kind of it goes. I, I think I said to you once. I, I like the idea that you die and it drifts out of your brain, and for a brief moment you're just there with no senses whatsoever, but you're still a thought. And then of course the winds slowly move it apart, and you go, Ugh, and then eventually you come back as a Boltzmann's brain. <laughs> yeah, it's That's a lovely it's a lovely idea. But but one kind of most reliable fact that we know about consciousness is its intimate dependence on a functioning brain. When the brain stops, consciousness stops. And this is kind of a fortunate thing because otherwise general anesthesia wouldn't work and general anesthesia is hands down the best invention we've ever had. 
And I highly recommend people watch, your, recommend TED. People watch your TED talk where you talk about when you uh, had general anaesthetic. It's a really uh, very, very interesting talk. And there's various other times. So, uh, Jenny, question for you. Uh, uh, would like to know what is going on. This is from No Name. What is actually going on in the brain when you have that tip of the tongue phenomenon? So you know it's there, but for some reason you are unable to access it. It's really, really common and it gets more common uh, if you're tired, which is why I might have got a few things wrong tonight because it's now 11 p.m. Uh, so I've been getting it a bit more than you guys for whom it's 3 p.m. Uh, one theory is that the way our memories are stored, when we sort of go to access a memory, lots of connected things are activated and then they have to sort of inhibit each other in order for the right one to win and become a conscious thought. And all of that's going on subconsciously. So what might happen with tip of the tongue phenomenon, which is quite hard to say, is that uh, the wrong one wins. So you've kind of activated a similar word because often you'll find that you're thinking of something else. You've got a word that's quite similar, but it might be that that one's actually blocking the right word and stopping it from coming to mind. So often you'll find if you stop trying so hard, it will pop into your mind a little bit later. Brilliant. And uh, thank you very much, by the way. I'm sorry we've run out of time. But thank you very I'm much. sorry we've run out of time. But thank you very much to uh, to Rosie, to Duncan, to Edward, and uh, and many other people who've been uh, asking questions. I've got one final question for you, Helen, uh, because it's about the octopus. So I think this might, perhaps everyone will be able to join in on this, which is, uh, can octopuses' arms think independently of their main brain? So well, let's park the word think for a bit, because <laughs> as we have established, that is a complicated thing. The arms of an octopus can definitely do stuff independent of the rest of their brain. And the fascinating thing, so octopuses have a distributed nervous system. And what that means is, so we have a very powerful image of ourselves as our brain is in here and it tells everything else what to do. Not always true all the time, but that's our, you know, the common image. Octopuses are not like that at all. They are, I am such a fan of octopuses. For, and like Anil says, you, when you meet one, um, it's 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 looking at you <laughs> for want of a better word it's very definitely evaluating stuff um but their their arms uh because they're not legs their arms do have uh neurons in them that have their own systems and the brilliant thing about that is not only can they make some decisions effectively by themselves they can talk to each other without talking to what we would think of as the main brain so that thing about not knowing whether what you know that that saying we have about the left hand not knowing what the right hand is doing octopuses literally do that um so they are they are fascinating creatures and they are invertebrates it's entirely the best thing about octopus intelligence is that it's entirely independently evolved there was the common last common ancestor with an octopus whatever your definition of consciousness is was not one of those it, it did not have <laughs> consciousness so so it, it is literally alien life it's brilliant which is why i think people should stop fussing about exoplanets and spend more time looking at the ocean frankly but yes yeah, so octopuses uh, can make their own make they can make decisions different parts of the octopus can make those decisions independently and I'll, last thing i'll say <laughs> along with that they are they have a a special little switch in there that lets them recognize themselves because octopuses are not social creatures there's only one place in the world where octopuses might perhaps live more than live closer together than a very very long way apart they do not like each other which is also contributes to that idea of our intelligence being due to social stuff because octopuses don't have that um so they tend to fight each other but they can recognize their own legs their their other arms so without checking with their brain because they so, so there's this whole interesting thing about how they can recognize themselves but they sort of have to put extra effort in because they're not talking to the rest of themselves all of the time brilliant so, thank, thank oh go on jenny i was just going to ask does that mean illusion the wouldn't work on an octopus i was just going to say that, that it uh, it's, it's back to back to where we started i think that's a very interesting question and it strikes me that it probably wouldn't and if I'm right, remembering rightly about this uh, octopus self-recognition, the way an octopus distinguishes self from another is, th is through taste. It, the skin has specific uh, chemicals that are specific to that individual and the ability to taste itself. So there was a whole series of experiments, which always struck me as kind of macabre, where they would take individual octopus arms separated from the octopus and give those arms other arms to see whether they would cling on to the arms. Um, and some of the arms they gave the detached arm had the skin on and some didn't. And um, the detached arm would quite happily behave as if it was going to eat 
another of its own arms if it didn't have the skin on. And this is why people, I am generally, I, I'm mostly vegan, vegan fine. fine. I'm generally tolerant of what other people eat, but people eating the sorts of dishes where they've got live octopus tentacles yeah. on the on a plate, I really have problems with that because that's alive. <laughs> and it's, you know, anyway. I don't, I don't eat octopus anymore since I learned all of this. Uh, yeah. It's one of the things I will not eat. The time I found human that. tastes very like octopus, so you can just swap it very easily. It's uh, swap it very easily. It's, it's cannibalization. Is the uh, Brian Cox doesn't. Brian Cox is the kind of person who actually will order something like black pudding because he knows I don't eat meat. So he he makes up for it by having more meat. But once he had a, a swim with an octopus, and his level of communication that he felt was shared there. Which is, you know, similar to experiences, but like people like Jane Goodall, you know, and she was talking the other day about pig casso, I think is called the painting pig. And it's one of those things where when you see the intelligence of a pig, considering it's one of the main creatures that is 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 consumed by a lot of people, uh, is uh, she said, yeah, it really puts people off because you go, there's a level of thought there. Well, it was in Lewis Carroll, wasn't it? That you're once you're introduced to something, you can't eat it. He got that right. A hundred years ago. That was a rule. <laughs> Well, thank you. Well, thank you all very much. And uh, Anil, you've got a new book coming out. And Ginny, you've got a new book coming out, both of which are relevant to this, but both of which you're going to have to, uh, uh, I'm afraid, uh, the delayed gratification because it's not going to be there both sometime out next spring. Can I just check, Ginny, what's yours called? Uh, oh, brain chemistry. Chemistry. And, and Anil, your book? It's called Being You, Consciousness and the Beast Machine, and it should be out next May. Brilliant. And I would recommend you mention Charles Fernhoff, the, uh, his book, The Voices Within, is, is the specific one we were talking about. There. He's written other very interesting books about the brain as well and or, or, the, or, or the human mind. Uh, Helen, of course, you can get, still get her book, Storm in a Teacup, as well. Um, thanks very much, everyone, for watching. As I said, the uh, we are now at a, a, a kind of plateau and, and slightly problematic point uh, in terms of Patreon. I realise that many people have very difficult situations out there. If you are able to and you can support us via Patreon, it does make a, a huge difference. It means we don't have to get adverts and we don't have to have any control from other people or anything like that um and that's that's really really useful so patreon or if you are able to just put something in the tip jar as well that keeps everyone going including trent uh trent has uh been saying today i mean it doesn't really keep keep him going at all um the uh he's a very demanding producer um but he uh also would like to say that, that he was doing something which only one one person watching this has noticed eileen cheng well done you noticed that he was playing a little bit of a kind of uh a, a visual mind trick game throughout the show i'm not going to tell everyone else what it was um if you're lucky trent might put it up and he might make some kind of he might even put it on the cosmic shambles site what he's been doing or you can watch this again and see if you can see the tomfoolery that uh, Tremt was playing at. I hope you all have uh, lovely weeks. Uh, I hope things are going okay for you and I hope you're all um, staying safe and uh, we will see you next Sunday. <laughs>